when I was in Brazil this past month, I was leading a retreat. And there were too many people on the retreat, even for group interviews. So we had a question box. People would write questions on slips of paper and stick them in the box. One day I happened to mention something about the psychic powers that come with meditation. There was a reference to Davis, I think, as well. So the next day, I got a question in the box. I don't want to hear anything about this supernatural stuff. I don't want to believe in anything that I can't see with my own eyes. That was the question. And then right next to it was another question. I said, why is it that people in Western Buddhism are so afraid of talking about the supernatural side of Buddhism? So the answer to the second question, of course, was the first question. In a form of Buddhism that's very sensitive to market forces, teachers tend to shy away from issues that would stir up the militant materialists. But the answer to the first question is a bit more complex. As I said that afternoon, how do you even know that the, what seems to be the natural world really is real? We don't have any proof that there really is a world out there, that other beings really exist. What we do know, though, is that people suffer. Now, some people have the karma to experience only a natural world, other people have the karma to experience a lot of supernatural things. But both kinds of people suffer. And this is what Buddhism is all about, is teaching us how not to suffer. The problem is not with the worlds out there. It's what's in our minds. The world may be real, it may not be real. This is another issue that came up during the retreat. Apparently in an earlier retreat someone had taught a retreat on the idea that reality is actually an illusion. Well, the Buddha never went that far. He didn't say the world doesn't exist. But the world is not the problem. The problem is inside. The suffering we create for ourselves is real, and the way we create it is real, even though we may be operating under illusions. The suffering we create from our illusions is real. And the way we can solve that problem is also real. There's a passage in the canon where one of the Buddha's disciples says he heard this directly from the Buddha, that suffering is real, not other, otherwise than it seems. The cause of suffering is real, not otherwise than it seems. The cessation and the path to cessation are real, not otherwise than what they seem. So this is what we have to focus on. I was talking this evening to someone who was saying, living in the monastery you must have it easy. No TV, no internet, nothing to stir up your defilements. And in some ways that's true. We're not constantly bombarded by all kinds of images to give rise to greed, aversion, delusion, lust, fear, whatever, that the media are churning out. But if we didn't have the germs for those things in our minds, the media wouldn't be able to do anything to us. And even when you're sitting perfectly alone with your eyes closed, you can fantasize all kinds of things, create all kinds of suffering for yourself from your fantasies. So when the world seems too much with us. You have to remind our defilements are too much with us. That's the real problem. This is why we meditate. This is why we look inside. The Dhammapada begins with two verses, basically saying, the mind is the forerunner of all things that are experienced. That's a very anti-materialist statement right there. The mind is not just on the receiving end, or it's not just an, what they call an epiphenomenon of physical things. The mind is the motive force in your experience. This is why I have to train the mind, so it's not going to create suffering for itself. Not going to create worlds of becoming. Just because these worlds are created doesn't mean they're illusory, but it doesn't mean they're they're fabricated. When everything that's fabricated, as the Buddha said, is stressful. The solution ultimately will be not to fabricate anything. But in the meantime, we have to fabricate a path, because you can't take nirvana and use it as a tool to gain nirvana. 
you take these things that we normally do, these fabrications, there's bodily fabrication, the breath, verbal fabrication, direct a thought and evaluation, i.e. the way you talk to yourself, and the mental fabrication, your feelings and perceptions. When we engage in these fabrications out of ignorance, they're going to cause suffering. When we do it with knowledge, in other words, understanding the processes, then it becomes part of the path. This focus on process is important. The issue about the reality of the world out there is the same as all the different theories we have. Are they true or are they not true about what's going on outside? Even if they're true, we can hold on to them in a way that causes us to suffer. That's the issue. When the Buddha analyzes why people have theories about the self, why they have theories about the world, it all comes down to not trying to figure out who's right and who's wrong, about what kind of self there is, what kind of world there is, whether they exist or not. The issue is, when we engage in this kind of activity, what happens as a result? Where does it come from? Where does it go? So we look at the processes of how we create suffering for ourselves and realize, okay, these processes are real. And if we bring knowledge to them, we understand them, we can take those processes and turn them into the path. So when you're sitting here focusing on bodily fabrication, i.e. the breath, and you're directing your thoughts and you're evaluating the breath, that's verbal fabrication. And then the perceptions of the breath. How do you perceive the breath? Is it just a little bit of air coming in out of the nose? How about think of the body as a big sponge and the, the breath can come in and out from all directions? What does that do to the way you feel the breath? What kind of sense of ease does that create? Or instead of thinking of the breath as something you have to pull in from outside, remember the breath is energy and the energy doesn't come from outside, it comes from within. The air comes from outside. But the movement of energy in the body that brings the air in, that's actually something that starts inside. What John Lee calls the resting spots of the breath. It could be right above the navel, right at the end of the breastbone, in the middle of the chest, base of the throat, all kinds of places in the body where you can sense that the breath radiates from that spot. And when you hold that perception in mind, what does that do? Look at the process, look at the results, because those things are real. So regardless of what your experiences are with the world outside, whether they all fall in line with the rules of, of materialism, or if they fall in line with other more supernatural things, you see faith healers and they do amazing things. There are a lot of uncanny things that happen in the world, but we can still suffer from them. There's a pride that comes with materialism. There's a pride that comes with people who say, I'm in touch with devas, I'm in touch with other supernatural things. That pride is really misplaced in both cases. As long as you're making yourself suffer from these things, there's work to be done. Unfortunately, the Buddha has a path for us all, regardless of what our experience of the world may be, or how we may conceive ourselves. He has a path for getting us out of the suffering that those views can entail. That's why his dharma is a gift to the entire world, of all beings. And it's up to us to decide whether we want to put ourselves within the net of that all-beings by putting the Dharma to practice. <laughs>